Good evening and welcome to our Holy Thursday service. We are conducting this service through our pre-recorded virtual experience and so we hope that this will be an opportunity for you to enter into the awareness and remembrance of Jesus's last night on earth with his disciples. As we continue this time of worship, we want to lift up to you the concerns of our church family. We have lost one of our dear members, Andy Whitaker, uh, this morning, and so we just ask you to continue to remember his widow and Lois Whitaker and his family in our prayers. As we worship together, we want to remind you that we are doing our virtual devotions Tomorrow on Good Friday, Reverend Austin Lippert will provide a devotion for you. And then Easter Sunday, we will have our beautiful celebration of Easter. As we are doing all services for the time being, it will be a virtual experience of Easter. And yet, it will be Easter. And so we invite you to take this time to enter into these last days when we remember the passion of Jesus. Let us worship the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, while we cannot gather with one another, gather us in the power of your Holy Spirit. While we have bread and wine before us that we cannot share, help us to remember Jesus, who on this night tasted the bitterness of betrayal, denial, and desertion. Help us to remember our Lord, who knelt down and washed the feet of his disciples. Help us remember his passion so that we might live more fully into his life that never ends. Amen. Who is this Jesus? We knew he was coming. The prophets told us about him. We even knew his family. Mary and Joseph, simple people, really. His birth sure took them by surprise. It took some of us by surprise as well. It took us a while to believe he was actually the one. Nothing has been the same since he came. When he was a young boy, his parents lost him in the city one day. They were terrified. They couldn't imagine what could have happened to him. They found him teaching the priests in the temple. The temple. He talked a lot about that when he was here. When he got older, he chased the money changers out. They disrespected the temple, and that made him angry. He said they didn't understand the sacrifices God wanted. He cleared the temple. The temple. John baptized him. When he came up out of the water, he glowed. God spoke. He went under and came up purified. He said he would do that again someday. His miracles were something to behold. He turned water into wine. He healed sick people. He made blind people see. He fed thousands of people with food he multiplied on the spot. He spoke, and a dead man walked out of a tomb. He calmed storms. He enjoyed the company of the less saintly. He was gentle with children. He confronted teachers and confounded intellectuals. He told stories. He was a teacher. 
when he came to Jerusalem, everyone gathered in the streets. It was a celebration. The Gospel reading comes from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17 and 31 through 35. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you as an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is a night I have consistently marked in ministry by gathering at the holy table. But tonight there is nothing familiar about this service. We cannot gather around a common altar and mark this holy night together as we watch the shadows fall. We cannot hear the familiar words of the communion liturgy and break the bread and share the cup together. However, in our lesson for tonight, we are not gathering around the Passover table where in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus institutes what we name the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, or the Holy Communion. In John's gospel, it's an ordinary table, a table just like the one where you just finished your last meal. In this gospel, Jesus does not bless and break bread, his body is lifted up on the cross the very day that the Jewish families were offering their Passover lambs 
for sacrifice. Even so, what happens at this table in the Gospel of John is significant. The Lord of the universe, the incarnate Son of God, kneels and washes the feet of his disciples. And then he asks them, Do you know what I have done to you? Hear the question again. Do you know what I have done to you? Most contemporary Christians are familiar with a different question. Do you know what Jesus has done for you? Some translations even record Jesus using the word for rather than to. But each word takes us in a different direction. Where does your mind go when you hear the question, do you know what I have done for you? My mind immediately goes to the many ways we understand and make sense of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. I thought of affirmations of faith, and I thought of theories of atonement. I assume that all of us began a long list of what we've been taught that Jesus has done for us. But tonight, let's grapple with the hard question that Jesus really asks his disciples and you and me. Do you know what I have done to you? Well, he was very clear in his later instructions. I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Set an example. I'm sure that while no one in their company enjoyed taking on the role of a servant and washing someone else's feet, they all knew the practice. It was custom. It was courtesy. It was expected that a host would welcome the guests by washing their feet, or more likely having a servant or a child wash their feet. But nothing as simple as continuing the custom in the Gospel of John. John almost always speaks of that which is tangible and visible to communicate the intangible and invisible truth of Jesus. Yes, Jesus washed their feet, but he had already bathed them in the grace, mercy, and love of God. That's why Peter was already clean and only needed to have his feet washed. Jesus had already bathed his followers. For the baptized Christian, that sign act said something in the moment about a ritual that may have occurred some time ago. A ritual where tangible, visible water signified the unseen, outpouring grace of God. In those moments before he was handed over to death and to glory, Jesus washed their feet so that they would remember that he had bathed them in the grace, mercy, and love of God. All of them. That night, Jesus knelt down and washed the feet of Judas, knowing, knowing that he would betray him. He knelt down and washed the feet of Peter, knowing that Peter would deny him. He knelt down and washed the feet of each and every one of his disciples, knowing that all of them would desert him. All of them. Jesus knelt down and washed their feet. He exemplified the truth that Paul declared so boldly. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not denial, not desertion, not even betrayal. On a night when everything seemed so unfamiliar, 
so different. We look at a basin of water and we remember our baptism. Tangible water calls to mind the words of familiar ritual, words about who Jesus is and how he has loved us. And we remember that Jesus has bathed us from head to toe in the expansive grace, love, and mercy of God. Jesus has done this to us. To us. But in the act of washing their feet, John points to yet another invisible act of God that those who were with him may not yet fully have perceived. The text says that Jesus left his place at the table and he knelt before them. He came to each one of them with that basin and towel and knelt before them, one by one. It is suggested that this act of kneeling was a visible reminder that their teacher was the Word of God who emptied himself and became flesh and lived among us as a servant. As Paul expressed it in the Philippian hymn, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. On the night before he was handed over to death and glory, in this sign act of kneeling down, Jesus claimed his identity as the incarnate God. He had taught them, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the light. I am the vine. In this sign act, he visibly identified himself as the one who left his place in the house of the Father. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and acted on our behalf. As they sat in awe while he washed their feet, they were very likely recalling what they had seen him do in those three years of ministry. He healed the sick. He welcomed the sinners. He challenged cultural injustice and religious practice. He gave new meaning to old ways of living. And he came to them, not with the authority of their teacher and their Lord, but as a servant. He said, I have set for you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. It is a dangerous example to follow. As he had left the house of the Father, so he called them and he calls us to follow him, leaving behind the lives that we know the places we call home, the people we love, and to enter into this relationship with him that will change our lives forever. He called them, and he calls us to a radical faith whereby we might even drink the cup that he drank. He set them an example of obedient faith that would lead some of those first disciples to be arrested and flogged, to be imprisoned, and some even executed. In this poignant act, Jesus called them to a radical love, a love that challenged them and challenges us to kneel at the feet of our neighbors, even our enemies, and to humble ourselves as he humbled himself as a slave. 
on a night in which everything seems so shockingly different. We remember that Jesus has set for us an example to follow him in life and death, to believe in him even in the worst of times, and to choose in every moment of life to love others as he has loved us. He has issued this call to us. And then he gave us a new commandment. Love one another. He gave this commandment to us. This pandemic may prevent us from gathering. It may prevent us from sharing in the bread and the cup. But it cannot prevent us from loving God and loving our neighbor. It can do many things to change our daily lives, but it cannot undo what Jesus has done to us. He has bathed us in the grace, mercy, and love of God and set for us an example of the life that is life. Tonight, we remember bread and wine, basin and towel, and the literary portrait of God kneeling at the feet of the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. Holy God, on this night in which we remember together what you have done to us, how you have loved us, how you have called us, how you have commanded us to love one another. We are thankful, thankful for who you are and how you have revealed yourself to us in Jesus. Join our hearts, O oh God, in this time when we are separated from one another in body, so that together we might share in the beauty and wonder of all of who you are, and give glory and praise to your name. As we offer you our praise and thanksgiving, we are mindful of the needs of a world where so many are fearful and anxious, where bodies are broken and families are grieving, where those who have less have even less and where those who are filled with anxiety about everyday circumstances are filled now with despair we pray O oh lord that even when our human resources might fail that we would find within your grace and love resources that never fail for you are our comforter, you are our advocate, you are our God, our Redeemer, our living hope. And so God, we come to you with all of the concerns of our hearts, with all that weighs upon us, and we offer them to you now even as we join our voices in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It was a celebration. 
Then things changed in a hurry. He was arrested and accused of nothing. Before we knew it, he was on trial. Before we knew it, he was walking up the hill with a cross. That's how this all happened. That's what the fuss is about. Do you hear those guards laughing while his mother sits beneath him crying? Don't they know who he is? It got dark early. It's been like this all day. It's probably better that we can't see him hanging there. Wait, did you hear him cry out just now? What did he say? Is he gone? It is finished. That's what he said. It is finished. God forgive us.
Jesus gave us an example. Jesus called us to follow him. Jesus gave us a new commandment. Rise up. Rise up, beloved, and go now to love God and your neighbor, to serve God and to serve your neighbor, knowing that you go with the blessing of the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.